Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com. Look us up in the sports section on Roku. We're there, Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, yesterday I made a video on an FBI report that contended that the first Ali Liston fight, the one in which Ali wins the title when Liston doesn't answer the bell in the middle rounds, was fixed. Right now I have had a lot of comments back from the YouTube community, right? And many people out there wanted to talk about not the first fight, but the second fight. Right? It's my belief that the first fight was not fixed. That the FBI report might be typical government propaganda, simply put, to undercut and devalue Ali's accomplishment in beating the odds and beating Sonny Liston. Right? Understand, I know it makes a lot of people uneasy, but devaluing the accomplishments of political figures like Ali right people of color unfortunately that's been a long history for the United States government right government propaganda historically here in the United States has been biased against people of color right simply put especially in the mid 60s the record is voluminous right so in the comment section, I noticed that rather than focus on that first fight, right, because I believe the film of the fight itself contradicts the official reports and the styles of the fighters, the fact that Ali, right, is faster than Sonny Liston, has more foot movement, right, the fact that Liston can't cut off the ring on Ali, right, really disproves, in my opinion, the FBI report. Right? So, many people are commenting on perhaps the most controversial punch in boxing history. The phantom punch. That's what it's called in the second fight. Right? I encourage people to look at yesterday's video on Ali Liston 1 and read the comment section. Many, many times, perhaps the majority of the times, the most interesting views expressed with regard to any video I make are actually from boxing fans here online in the comment section. Sometimes the comments are much more interesting than the video, right? I would encourage you to read the comments. Well, let's talk about that second fight. Right? Just understand, my perspective is simply that of a gambler. Right? Gamblers really aren't interested in the hype. We're trying to get an edge on the casino. What I believe that leads to is a healthy skepticism about official versions. Right? We like to look at things and ask ourselves, is this right? Right? Is this event legit? Was it legit? Did the right guy win? Or were things uneven? Right? Was this fighter overvalued? Was this fighter undervalued? Did this fighter have an off night? Or did this fighter throw the fight? Right? So, let's talk about this. Now, what I want people to do, and the film is very short, right, is to first look at a video here online called Anchor Punch, right? Ali, after this knockout, claimed that the punch he threw was an anchor punch that he learned from a Hollywood actor named Stepin Fetchit. 
Yes, black people, we've come a long way, right? But, you know, the point is Ali claimed that he planned it so that as Liston came forward, he was anchored and he was able to get off a very quick, hard punch based on really the movement of the two guys, Liston coming forward, Ali anchoring himself. What I want people to do is to look at the video called Anchor Punch. It's a short video. It has not only Ali's punch on Liston, but it has a more recent fight. Anderson Silva, MMA great, knocking out a guy while backing up. It looks like Silva has perhaps even less leverage than Ali had against Liston. And you actually see Silva's opponent, literally paralyzed by the shot, hit the canvas, and his leg is extended. It's clear that that knockout is legitimate. Right? What people need to realize is that movement in the ring matters. It's not how hard I throw the punch. It's how fast you're moving into the punch when I throw it and how unprepared you are for the punch. It's the punches that you don't see that hurt you the most. Right? So just like Silva's opponent is completely knocked out by Silva's punch. Just like a boxing great Gene Fulmer, one of the legendary chins in boxing history, was completely knocked out by Ray Robinson's punch as Ray Robinson's backing up in their famous fight. By the way, Fulmer beat Robinson on other occasions. But there's one fight where Robinson's backing up, just like Ali, hits Fulmer, and Fulmer, great chin, is knocked unconscious. I believe that's what happens here in the Ali Liston fight. Right? Liston isn't knocked unconscious, but he's disoriented. Let's talk about the evidence. Okay? As Liston comes forward, Ali is backing up. Right, Ali throws a short right hand. Right, short right hand. What I want you to do as you look at the video is ask yourself, where does that punch hit Sonny Liston? Right, the best film I've located on that punch is from the back of Liston. Liston has his head turned this way. You actually see Liston's head move, right? You see Liston's head move when he's hit with this shot. I would argue that the punch hits Liston right on the temple, right? Take a look at the film. The punch hits Liston right on the temple. Folks, one of the best places to hit any fighter to upset their equilibrium is exactly where Sonny Liston gets hit with the phantom punch right he gets hit right on the temple right right on the temple now let me point out that if you look further on the film, what you're going to see next, they're different films of the event, is take a look at Liston's feet. You're going to see that one of Liston's legs immediately leaves the canvas, jumps up off the canvas, immediately, on impact. Right, he's turned this way, he gets hit on the temple, 
then I believe it's his right leg immediately comes up off the canvas right immediately now if you believe that this punch is phantom that this punch is fake then you necessarily have to believe in my opinion that Sonny Liston is one of the best actors ever caught at any time on film right because Liston's reactions are instantaneous right Liston's leg comes up off the canvas immediately this isn't some kind of situation where Liston is thinking it through and then decides to do this that and the other no, Liston is hit, his head moves, he's hit on the temple, right? You see Liston coming in. By the way, where's Ali? Ali's where Liston would want him to be, right? Ali looks like he's close enough to the ropes. Liston has just spent a fight, the fight where he loses his title, trying desperately to get Ali up on the ropes, Right? He's trying desperately. So here, Ali is relatively close to the ropes. Liston leaps in. This is Liston's moment to get back his title. Now, Ali, while moving, just like Anderson Silva, throws a short punch. Punch doesn't look like it has a lot on it. But it lands right on Liston's temple as Liston is lunging forward. Understand, the velocity doesn't come from Ali's punch. It comes from Liston's movement. Now, to the critics of the punch who question its legitimacy, tell us here in the comment section how Liston literally is able to look like he's been hit in the temple he moves his head right at the right time and then of course is such a good actor that he has his right leg immediately jump off the canvas immediately after getting hit right is there anything in Liston's background that you're aware of that would suggest that Liston is that good of an actor let's talk about the part of this that actually troubled Emmanuel Stewart. Right? Stewart, by the way, thought the punch was legit. But question Liston on the canvas. Right? When Liston hits the canvas, we're taking this moment by moment. When Liston hit, hits the canvas, he rolls around on the canvas. Stewart thought Liston was overdoing it on the canvas. Right? Well, my question is simply, because keep in mind, if you're lunging forward and you get hit in the temple and your balance is gone, sometimes your body is doing weird things when you're on the canvas, off temple shots, right? When Liston's on the canvas, does he look worse? Then Zab J Judah looked on the canvas when he got knocked down by Costa Zoo. Does he look worse than Trevor Burbeck looked on the canvas when he got knocked down by Mike Tyson? Does he look worse than Steve Cunningham looked on the canvas when he got knocked down by Johan Hernandez? Does he look worse than Montiel looked when he got knocked down, temple shot, by Nonito Denier? Let me tell you, when you're fully conscious, you're fully conscious, and you get hit with a punch that you did not see, your body might not be ready to be on the canvas. Sonny Liston's on the canvas, and he's rolling on the canvas. Understand, just seconds earlier, he was fully conscious on his feet. 
In my opinion, his body is no different than, let's say, the body of Zab Judah when he was on the canvas against Costa Zoo. Right? The fact that you're squirming on the canvas after getting hit flush with a temple shot doesn't mean that you're throwing the fight. Right? We know Zab Judah, by the way, got off the canvas. When the fight got stopped, he goes over to the ref. By the way, he gets off the canvas too fast, falls back down to the canvas, gets back up, goes over to the referee when the fight stopped, is upset because he wanted to continue. This is after looking terrible on the canvas, looking like a fish just popped out of the ocean. Right now, Sonny Liston gets hit, is on the canvas, is trying to gather his thoughts, right, is rolling around the canvas, moving, just like Steve Cunningham moved against Johan Hernandez, right? If you believe that Liston's movement on the canvas shows that the fight was fixed, then please tell us whether the Cunningham fight was fixed, the Zab Judah fight was fixed, the Trevor Burbeck fight was fixed. Isn't squirming on the canvas after getting knocked unexpectedly on the temple something that has happened many times in boxing? If it's happened many times in boxing, what is it about this time that makes this time different? Now, let me say this, too. There's more to the story, right? Because the fight has many flaws. Let me point out that the referee was former heavyweight champion Jersey Joe Walcott. You may remember him. He's the one who lost his title to Rocky Marciano. He's also the victim of one of the worst decisions in boxing history. I think historians know he beat Joe Lewis. To Joe Lewis's credit, when the decision was announced, Lewis himself had already left the ring because Lewis's people believed they had lost the fight, right? Lewis didn't want hollow victories, right? Well, let me say this. They had a heavyweight champion as the referee in the fight. Now, what happens after Liston hits the canvas is very important, right? Ali doesn't go to his neutral corner. Ali is dancing around the ring. He doesn't go to his neutral corner. Now, students of the game here online know, especially from the Gene Tunney, Jack Dempsey fight, that the count can't start until Ali is in his neutral corner. Right? We know that. I don't care how long Liston's on the canvas. Right? Liston could have had a sleeping bag and a pillow with him on the canvas, right? The count of 10 does not start until Ali goes to his neutral corner, right? It can't. So Jersey Joe Walcott is trying to get Ali to his neutral corner. You see him in the ring. He's trying to corral Ali. He's trying to get Ali to his neutral corner. Folks, that's the right thing to do. That's what the referee is supposed to do. The referee is supposed to get the fighter out of his neutral corner to a neutral corner. Right? Because we don't want situations where the guy who gets the knockdown stands over the other fighter. Right? We have a neutral corner requirement. Well, there was a boxing person in the stands, a guy named Nat Fleischer, who I have no doubt had the best of intentions. I believe he might have been affiliated with Ring Magazine, right? He counted that Liston was on the canvas more than 10 seconds. So there was bedlam, as you can imagine, right? In real time, things aren't organized. This is real life. Fleischer walks from the crowd over to the ring and tells Joe Walcott, the fight should be over because Liston has been on the canvas 
more than 10 seconds. Right? By this point, Liston has already gotten up off the canvas. Look at the film. And what's Liston doing? Liston's trying to fight Ali. Right? If you believe Liston threw the fight, why is Sonny Liston, once he gets his thoughts, up trying to fight Muhammad Ali? If you believe that the count shouldn't have started until Ali got to a neutral corner, right, then let me ask you, shouldn't this fight have continued? Shouldn't Liston have been allowed to continue to fight Ali as he was doing, right? Because there was no 10 count when Liston was on the canvas. Look at the film. Ali doesn't go to a neutral corner. Walcott doesn't count out Sonny Liston. Right? So understand, if the rules were followed, right? If Nat Fleischer doesn't convince Joe Walcott to call an end to the fight, the phantom punch wouldn't have ended the fight. So I believe when you look at the film, when you look at the rules that should have been enforced, when you look at Liston's head, where it gets hit, how Liston's head leans back, and then Liston's leg, how Liston's leg immediately comes off the canvas, folks, you can't fake that. And how Liston gets up off the canvas and continues fighting. How Liston is never counted out in the fight. In my opinion, that leads to the conclusion that that phantom punch was a real punch. We have a term in boxing. Flash knockdowns. Right? They happen. They have always happened. There are always fights where a guy is fighting another guy, gets hit with a punch, hits the canvas. Bernard Hopkins Segundo Mercado. Hopkins gets caught. Hopkins hits the canvas. Hopkins gets back up. You want another middleweight great with a great chin who hits the canvas? How about Marvin Hagler, Juan Rodin? Hagler gets hit. Hagler hits the canvas. Hagler quickly gets back up. Here you have Sonny Liston, energized, sees Ali, who he's been trying to corner, Right? For several rounds, right? Keep in mind, this is the rematch. This is the second fight. Liston tries to corner him in the first fight. Isn't quite able to do it. So we're in the second fight. Ali is close to the ropes. You see the ropes in the background. Liston lunges forward. Ali throws a short right hand. It's a short right hand that lands right on Liston's temple. In my opinion, that's the key to the fight, right? Sonny Liston goes down. Why? Because he's just run into something. He runs into the punch. He goes down, right? His legs show that they buckle immediately after that punch, right? The right leg jumps up immediately after that punch. He gathers his thoughts on the canvas, gets back up, not only is ready to continue fighting, he actually is continuing to fight. That's not a guy throwing the fight. Let me say this too. I understand there's a film someplace in which Ali, right after the fight, turns to his corner and says, did I hit him? People need to understand that that's commonplace in boxing. Right? When Mike Tyson fought Francois Botha, Right, Tyson drops Botha. Botha hits the canvas like a sack of potatoes. The knockout is devastating. Mike Tyson in interviews after that fight said he didn't even know that that punch landed. This is a devastating punch. Right, but you're in the middle of the war zone when you're in the ring. The bullets are flying. Right? The point here is simply Ali throws the punch, Liston runs into it, it hits Liston in the perfect spot. 
I don't believe that fight was thrown. I don't believe Sonny Liston in his prime, knowing that this was the rematch and that if he lost this fight, he'd be 0-2 against Ali and not in the best position in a competitive heavyweight division to demand a third fight, a further rematch. I don't believe Sonny Liston would throw a fight and give up his title this way. It doesn't make sense. Title opportunities only come around once every few years, right? Understand Sonny Liston, you know, was still a dominant fighter at the time. He would put together after this fight a string of knockouts. He wouldn't lose again until, you know, the late 60s, years later, against Leotis Martin, right? And Liston was a knockout puncher. Look at his fight history. Not a lot of wear on the tires. I know there are those who speculate that Liston was older than official records indicate, right? Liston himself didn't know how old he was. This was a different time in America. And that Liston may have been trying to cash out, right? Understand that theory is ridiculous because Sonny Liston was a knockout puncher. You were lucky to make it to the second half of a fight against Sonny Liston. There wasn't a lot of wear on the tires. Let me also point out, too, Leotis Martin, the guy who stopped Sonny Liston, right, stops his winning streak later in the decade. Did you know that Ring Magazine rated Leotis Martin one of the 100 hardest punchers in boxing history? Right? Research him. Right? It's an eye-opener. By the way, the Leotis Martin fight, in which Sonny Liston gets knocked out. And by the way, even after that fight, Liston beats Chuck Wepner. Look at the record. But the Leotis Martin fight. You know, Liston fought so hard in that fight that that fight ended Leotis Martin's career. Right? Martin ended up with a detached retina. This was back in an era where you didn't have the level of surgery to reattach detached retinas that you have now. Back then, a Ray Leonard or an Abner Maris wouldn't be able to continue, right? Leotis Martin wasn't able to continue. So the point is simply, Sonny Liston was a fierce competitor. To me, it's simply implausible that a heavyweight champion would give up his title in a rematch, right? You know... The rematch is his one chance to win the title back. Let me also point out that if you're thinking Liston was bribed or something like that, again, just ask yourself, if you're the heavyweight champion, right, why would you take a bribe when you could probably make more money than the bribe by just winning two title fights, right? That's even if the bribe was so big that it was more than your payday. Also, some people have mentioned Liston's curious death, right? Well, if you know anything about Liston's death, you'll also realize Liston wasn't living that large, right? If Liston's supposed to have been bribed for the first Ali fight, then bribed for the second Ali fight, I think the FBI report claimed that Liston made a million dollars, you know, in bribes for the first uh, fight. Where was the money? Right? Liston is living rather modestly. Also, if Liston wanted to check out of boxing in the mid-60s, why do his friends believe that Sonny Liston was about to announce some big fight? Liston was still in the fight game at the time of his death. Also, Let me make the obvious point. Liston doesn't die for several years after this second Ali fight. How do we know that his death is even remotely connected to a fight that took place half a decade earlier? Right? I'll agree Liston's death is cloudy. Right? But I don't think it's fair to look at Liston's death and then reach the conclusion that that means 
that something untoward happened against one opponent, Muhammad Ali. Right? Let me also make another point, too. Boxing. I know that Liston, you know, uh, was a person in boxing who may not have been the best role model, right? I personally think Liston was a great role model, but I understand he may not have played to corporate America, right? Liston apparently after the first fight was found in a car with half a bottle of vodka and a woman much younger than him. Okay, fair enough. Liston was a player. Big deal, right? But understand, the establishment at the time was much more afraid of the black Muslims and Muhammad Ali than they were Sonny Liston. You know, maybe Liston was controversial. He certainly wasn't as controversial as Muhammad Ali. Understand, at the time, the black Muslims were rumored. I'm not saying the rumors were right, but the black Muslims were rumored to have assassinated Malcolm X. Right? Ali was going around talking about how people shouldn't call him by his slave name. Right? Elijah Muhammad, simply put, was a figure that scared the social establishment. Right? Scared the mainstream. So I even have a hard time with the idea that, you know, this was a move to get the mob out of boxing and stuff like that. That's ridiculous. Right? So, to sum up, I think the second fight was legit. I think Ali throws a short right hand that hits Liston on the temple. I think Liston wanted to continue fighting so bad that after he gets his thoughts, he gets back up and actually tries to continue the fight. The fight should have continued since there's no 10 count. Right? Certainly, it can't be argued that it was Liston's intention to have the fight end there. If it was, why would he ever get off the canvas? Let me hear from you. I want to hear your thoughts. As I said before, sometimes the best parts of these videos are the comments. Let me hear yours. Thanks for stopping by.